Okay, so this month we're going to take a look at um, a, just a brief introduction to programming the GPU with CUDA and Thrust. Now, this is not the only way to program a GPU. I will just mention that there's OpenCL, um, but this presentation is about CUDA. So CUDA is specific to NVIDIA hardware. I'm not aware of any um, vendor for, of other GPUs that provides a CUDA implementation. I've heard of uh, CUDA translator layers that people sell, but I'm not familiar with those, so we're not going to say anything more about it. Uh, CUDA is supported by NVIDIA on Linux and Windows. And this talk is an introduction only. CUDA is a very broad and deep topic. And I'm only a novice CUDA programmer. I am by no means a uh, CUDA expert. I did run this by one of my coworkers who I do consider to be a CUDA expert. And he didn't uh, point out anything blatantly wrong. But if there is anything wrong in here, it's my fault and nobody else's. Uh, so... Um, the GPU or graphics processing unit has been around on the PC for quite a long time. So they started out as just, you know, the CGA card or an EGA card or a VGA card or super VGA card, etc. All those acronyms referring to the geometry in terms of pixels of the display that was supported and, you know, usually the number of bits of color per pixel and so on. But basically all these systems had one thing in common, which is the display memory used by the graphics hardware is just part of the memory address space of the machine. So you just manipulate the frame buffer like you're manipulating memory. And then, and that was fine for DOS. Um, DOS didn't have a, a huge device abstraction, but when Windows came along, they now had an abstract API that represented how you manipulated the frame buffer. You no longer manipulated the frame buffer by just reading and writing raw memory. That was reserved for the device driver. So the next piece of acceleration to come along were so-called fixed function accelerators. And these are pieces of dedicated hardware that performed the various graphics operations as defined by the Windows API initially. And then later they start accelerating um, the 3D graphics APIs, uh, OpenGL at first, and then DirectX. And somewhere in there was also a proprietary vendor specific API called Glide. All of these ended up with um, acceleration paths for the graphics processing unit where it could now accept commands and operate on those commands instead of just acting as dumb memory with pixels inside. It, around the 2000s, uh, beginning with DirectX 8 was the first version of DirectX to introduce this. And I believe that the OpenGL version supporting shaders came out around the same time. Um, we got programmable shader blocks. These were initially assembly instruction coded blocks and then eventually became programmable in a higher level C-like language. The DirectX variant was called High Level Shader Language, HLSL, and the OpenGL variant was called GL Shader Language, GLSL, and they were largely identical. And the reason these two APIs track each other in functionality is because they're actually not tracking each other, they're tracking the hardware. So as the hardware evolves, each API supports the new hardware features. And this led to... Um, the ability for the first time to, in, in a, well, even, sorry, let me back up a second. Even with a fixed function accelerator, as the fixed function accelerators got fancier with more options and controls and data paths available to them, it was possible to do a style of general purpose computation as long as your problem matched a very specific uh, set of constraints in the parallelism. Namely, you had to be able to take your problem and turn it into some kind of pixel representation and then do a pixel operation 
as part of your computation and then read the pixels back and map that back into your problem domain. So with even with fixed function accelerators, you could sort of do general purpose computation, but it was very restricted. Uh, once you got programmable shader blocks, then even though you're still operating within this fiction of a graphics pipeline, and I say fiction because you're not really interested in producing an image. What you're interested in doing is performing some kind of computation on a regular grid, which is a process that you can do in graphics by simply drawing a rectangle that covers the whole screen. That guarantees that the per pixel shader runs for every pixel on the screen. And you can also do some tricks where the attributes that you attach to this rectangle that you drew on the screen get interpolated across the screen and they can become input parameters to your shader blocks. However, it's still trying to do general purpose computation by fitting this square peg of general purpose computation into the round hole of these shader blocks provided by graphics pipelines. In November 2006, CUDA, introdu CUDA was introduced by NVIDIA and CUDA completely disconnects you from the graphics pipeline and lets you just program the GPU function units without having to pretend that it's a vertex shader or a pixel shader or, you know, somehow doing operations with textures as inputs. You can just give up all of that and deal directly with GPU processing in a general purpose manner without even writing a single OpenGL call, for instance, or a single DirectX call, or calling any library that calls any of those functions. So that leads us to where we are now. And so what is CUDA? It is stands for the Compute Unified Device Architecture. It's for general purpose parallel processing, not just graphics. The um, abstraction exposed by CUDA is to think of the GPU as a very powerful coprocessor to the CPU. And you write C++ code directly. You don't write in one of these weird shader languages or any some kind of other language. You write in C++. So why would you want to use CUDA? Well, the um, the GPU provides a very different performance point than the CPU. And if you've got an NVIDIA GPU in your system and you're processing um, large amounts of data or the amount of processing that you have to perform is very compute intensive, it could be that using these CUDA cores can make a, a big difference in how your application performs. Um, and given that we can just program it in C++, it's not too far afield from what we're already doing for software running on the CPU. And here's a little diagram I found in, um, illuminating from the CUDA toolkit. So on the CPU, the silicon budget the transistors within the chip that are devoted to specific tasks are much more fun focused on running a few, relatively speaking, threads that are um, able to be switched out at a moment's notice for other threads. You know, they may block on complex I.O. and so on. And the CPU is more targeted in terms of uh, transistor real estate towards running a few threads and being able to switch them a lot. Whereas in the GPU, the real estate of the transistors is more dedicated to having more cores, but they um, they run in uh, an environment where they're not switched as often. The context switch doesn't happen as much as it does on the the CPU, and they're actually the individual cores are actually weak compared to a CPU core, but they managed to outpower the CPU by having so many of them and being able to operate uh, on memory in, in a fashion that's that can be faster than the CPU. So um, CUDA gives you a an abstraction of the hardware so you, you don't 
um, typically write anything that is, you know, a direct assembly language for the particular GPU that you have, you write in C++. And to interact with the unique characteristics of the hardware and the GPU, namely the fact that it's a big parallel grid of processors, um, the hardware is exposed as a set of abstractions of a hierarchy of thread groups, a hierarchy of shared memories, and synchronization primitives that allow you to coordinate the threads that are operating in parallel. And there is both fine-grained data parallelism and thread parallelism, but those are, uh, that fine-grained parallelism is orchestrated in, as a small block of threads, and those blocks are nested within coarse-grained data parallelism and task parallelism across the entire device. So the approach is you take your problem, you subdivide it into, into sub-problems that can be all solved independently, and then you take those uh, results that were all computed independently and combine them into the, into the final result. So it's... Um, It's a divide and conquer approach, essentially. And those uh, sub problems can be solved by threads that are cooperating by interacting with the same uh, piece of shared memory between those threads. Whereas the course problems are all being computed independently of each other and they're not interacting at all. Except maybe you aggregate it on the, on the host. So um, here's a, just a visualization of that, that you, your problem space is this grid that's shown here in green. And you take your grid, divide that up into a bunch of chunks. Each one is a block. And then within each block, there's a bunch of um, collaborating threads within a block. So the blocks here are the sub-problems. Given this subdivision of the problem, if you run on different GPUs, the GPUs have streaming multiprocessors in them that can accept blocks and schedule blocks onto the threads that are inside the SMs. So you carve up your problem into blocks, and depending on the size and number of the SMs on your GPU, they get scheduled automatically by the driver, and then you get an answer when they're all done, however however that takes place. However, it's partitioned among the SMs, and um, it's possible that if your blocks are small relative to the number of threads within the SM, multiple blocks can be scheduled onto a single SM. And this is fine, because remember, all these blocks represent the parts of the problem that can be solved independently of each other. So exactly what order and how they get scheduled onto the GPU doesn't matter. All, we, all we're interested in is finding out when they're all done. The hierarchy of memory in a GPU is just as important for your final performance as the hierarchy of memory is on your CPU, right? So if you have an algorithm that runs on the CPU and its data memory access pattern is such that the, the data being accessed can't all fit in your data cache, you're going to find your program runs a lot slower if it has to process a large amount of data. If you can reorganize that memory access pattern so that the uh, accesses are more coherent, then you will get more cache hits, and then you will get the get the data to the CPU faster than if you are experiencing cache misses. And so, in the, the GPU, the same thing is true. There's obviously there's registers that each thread has. Each thread has its own set of registers, so uh, it doesn't share registers with other threads within the same block. Each thread has its own registers, and then there is local memory that is exclusive to that particular thread. And then with between the threads in a block, there is a group of shared memory that can be used for these threads to cooperate and solve the subproblem. So if you um, 
if you have a so-called trivially or embarrassingly parallel algorithm where there's no communication needed between adjacent elements in order to, to get things done, then great. You don't even need shared memory. You can just do everything in embarrassingly parallel fashion. But most interesting problems have some sort of interaction between adjacent elements or between elements within a block. You know, elements in your subproblem in order to compute the the answer for the subproblem. So um, after the thread's local memory, the next fastest memory is the shared memory that is available to threads in a block. And then after that, you've got global memory. The global memory is the slowest, but uh, at some point, you know, the data has to get in from the global memory into your uh, thread that is computing the result. So, um, in the uh, CUDA toolkit, they go through an example where they show how they increased the performance of their implementation by taking a chunk of the global memory that they read once and copying it into the shared memory between threads where it's read multiple times in the course of computing the answer. And that resulted in a performance improvement because the shared memory is faster access time for the threads in that block. Uh, there's also constant and texture memory spaces. Uh, constant memory is um, handy for bits of data that don't change during the execution of any of the threads, but might change every time you uh, invoke code on the GPU. But they're not changing for the duration of waiting for some GPU computation to complete. So constant memory can be useful for that. It can take pressure off shared memory, or um, it, it, it is also faster than global memory, so it's a good place to put values that don't change as you're computing. Uh, texture memory spaces, um, they have special units that um, are in the graphics pipeline that do texture processing, and this can be useful for uh, if you have to do interpolating style sampling of a regular grid of values, this is something that the texture units do already by themselves. So you can sample the texture from uh, floating point coordinates so you get interpolation between discrete values within the grid, your grid of values, whether it is they are pixel, pixels, picture elements, or whether they are just data values, it doesn't really matter as far as the texture hardware is concerned. So that can be useful to access that um, texture memory space along with the texture processing, which you can do. Okay, so what is the concept of how this works? So there is, um, as we said, that the host is basically using the GPU as a coprocessor. And typically your host code will go through a loop until you're computation is finished, or maybe it's an interactive application, in which case, you know, it just goes through this loop forever, where you have some data that comes from the host and is sent down to the device, the GPU. You run some code on the GPU to get some kind of analysis of that data performed, and usually you um, get the data back on the host. Now, if you're just going to keep some kind of uh, interactive application, you know, on the uh, a machine where you're displaying the results graphically perhaps or something, um, maybe you don't need to send the data back to the host. It's not required that you do that. It's just this is a common data flow for a lot of applications. Device code is the code that is running on the GPU. And this is looked at from the point of view of host code of running a kernel. And it's basically a function call. And it is executed, the code uh, that is in the kernel, the, the function that is the kernel rather, is the code that is executed by all the threads on the GPU. So it is a so-called single instruction multi, multiple threads style execution as opposed to uh, single instruction multiple data. And that's because um, in a SIMD scenario, an individual data element can't, uh, that, or, or the processing assigned to an individual element in the multiple data part 
it's all the same instructions. So you can't have divergent execution across the elements. Whereas within uh, SIMT, which is multiple threads, the threads can process an if statement and one thread takes the true branch and the other thread takes the else branch. Um, there's a bunch of details you can read in the toolkit documentation about how this looks from the point of view of the hardware implementation. Um, it, it's still just kind of a high level view. Um, and device code has access to all the device resources directly. And this includes uh, special data types that are implemented in the functional units of the GPU that aren't implemented in host code. Things like 16 bit floating point values. Um, there's values in uh, special graphics related formats. Um, there's also the different memory types are directly accessible, as we said before, that there's constant memory, texture memory, shared memory, global memory. You can also interoperate with graphics APIs. So if your goal is to do some parallel computation and then visualize the results, it's not necessary to copy the results back to the host just so you can get them back into the graphics card for display. So you can interoperate directly with the graphics APIs and have a resource that is shared by the graphics API and by CUDA so that CUDA can either read or write from this resource and the graphics system can then treat it as an input, like a texture or something. The um, typical way that you would program CUDA is to use the so-called runtime API. And this gives you um, just a bunch of function calls to let you manipulate resources on the device, allocate memory, deallocate memory, schedule a thread for launch, and so on. Um, there's also a math API that gives you uh, a lot of the standard math functions. So these can be considered um, built into CUDA itself, as opposed to being provided by an external compiler. Um, it's mostly a, a convenience for um, when you do dynamic compiling of CUDA code and load that dynamically into the GPU instead of just at the time you build your application. You might have, um, you know, templated GPU code that changes based on the user's options and you want to take that code and compile it at the time you're running the application that is certainly possible with CUDA. There's also a large number of middleware libraries, um, basic linear algebra subroutines, JPEG codec, fast Fourier transform. Now they just recently um, gave a presentation on this implementation of the C++ standard library for C++ on the GPU in CUDA. I haven't looked at um, that in detail, so I don't know to what extent the standard library is available. I would expect it's going to be the iterators, containers, and algorithms portion that they're concerned with, it, not things like formatted I.O. and stuff like that. Um, there's ram high quality random number generation. If you ever do any stuff in cryptography or encryption, then having a high quality random number generator implementation is important. Um, also dealing with sparse matrices or image or signal processing. Um, we me I mentioned the uh, runtime compilation is supported through a, an additional library. Uh, and there's a linear system solver. There's, and these are just libraries that come with the CUDA toolkit. There are hundreds, if not thousands of libraries built on top of CUDA or the, these libraries that come with the CUDA toolkit itself. So what does this look like to program this? Well, you get some language extensions and the language extensions allow you to mix device code and host code in the same file. So it's not like you have a magic um, build system rule that says files with this certain extension, like CPP, get they get compiled with the host compiler. And then maybe you've got GPP 
files and they get compiled with the device um, compiler. In CUDA, the philosophy is that stuff can be all mixed together in the same file and, and actually the file extension doesn't really mean much in terms of the compiler itself. It um, obviously automatic pattern matching build rules and stuff care about the extensions that you use. But um, you have your grid of blocks that represents your subproblems to be solved and you have the dimensions of the blocks containing how many threads are going to be cooperating to solve the subproblem and those dimensions can be specified for these kernel functions with this triple chevron syntax and that just makes it easy to uh, configure a GPU launch of code and get back, you know, the result from that computation given a, a specific grid and block configuration. And really, it's just syntactic sugar for turning that notation into a bunch of uh, API calls to configure the GPU uh, launch parameters and launch the kernel and so on. So it, it makes it simpler, but if for whatever reason you need to go lower, it's possible, but there's not really any gain from, from doing that. So fortunately, the simple and straightforward thing is, the, is, is also the recommended thing. Um, so this happens by way of the MVCC compiler driver. This is the thing that takes your source files first and transforms them into uh, standard C++ that then is fed on to the native compiler on your machine. And it generates MVCC while it's processing your code. If it finds device code that runs on the device, it compiles that into the GPU assembly language that's used. And it is stripped out from the source code that is seen by the native compiler so that it ends up as a build output, but um, it's not seen after MVCC processes it. It doesn't get passed along to the host compiler, which is used only for host code at that point. So you could program the GPU directly in its abstract assembly language, which is called PTX, which is a defined instruction set. You can go and look at the documentation supplied by NVIDIA. When you um, normally just tell it to tell your uh, build system to you know just compile with MVCC, it may select a targeted uh, streaming multiprocessor version, an SM version. It may say like you know SM five zero or something, and that's taking the CUDA code that has to run on the device and compiling it to a specific architecture. And that may not be desirable because you may want to take advantage of improvements in the um, MVCC compiler or take advantage of improvements in the, the PTX compiler. And you can instead, when you compile with MVCC, you can just generate PTX instead of um, SM version specific uh, binary files that are called kubins. Either MVCC can generate the kubins or it can generate the so called, you know, versionless PTX. And that gives you a way, if you're generating PTX, it gives you a way of kind of feature proofing your application so that if new shader, or sorry, not shader model, but uh, streaming multiprocessor instruction set versions come out, then the generic PTX can be JIT compiled to target that GPU in a possibly more efficient manner. Um, I think what most people do, though, is they select the versions that they want to support um, I see there's a question in the chat. We'll get to that in a second. The, the, the versions that you want to support can be cooked into the, your build process so that when 
the user is running on the version that you support, it just directly loads that binary into the GPU and there's no translation happening. You can combine that with the PTX approach to give you the, the feature proofing by having both the PTX and the kubin in your executable. And then if the version that the user has doesn't match any of the versions that you targeted specifically, it'll fall back to the generic PTX. And the question is from the chat is uh, by host code, am I referring to code that runs on the CPU? And the answer is yes. You, we'll see this when we look at an example in a second. I think it will become more clear. So in the uh, C++ language, they've added extensions for specifying execution space specifiers uh, that say whether this code is going to run as a kernel, that's the global, whether it's going to run only on the host or only on the device. And then memory space specifiers that allow you to specify, a, you know, a variable is attached to a particular memory space on the GPU. Um, you also have um, built into the language and not supplied by a header file. Uh, you have uh, vector types that are commonly used on GPU oriented uh, processing because the, the functional units in the GPU are not necessarily they, although they can be used to process scalar values, they're usually arranged as a four wide vector. So operating on one, two, three, or four wide uh, data quantities as a single uh, data type is preferred. Um, there's also built in variables that tell you the um, dimensions of the grid, the dimensions of blocks, which block you are in and which thread within the block you are in and the uh, warp size. Um, most of the time you won't need to worry about warp size. If, if you need to know it, one or, or sorry, if you want to see about warps, I would recommend reading the toolkit documentation on it. A, a warp is a measure of scheduling in terms of how well your blocks fit to the computational units in the streaming multiprocessors. Um, there's also built-in functions for synchronization between threads, because as we said, that within a block, the threads are operating cooperatively to solve the subproblems. So here is, this is lifted straight from the CUDA toolkit samples. This is just a, an example of taking a two one-dimensional vectors that are inputs, adding them together to produce another one-dimensional vector that is the output. So here is the function that is our kernel, vec add, it's, I, it's a kernel function by virtue of the fact that it's decorated with that double underscore global. And we are using the global variables uh, block dim and block index and thread index to identify which of the input elements in these vectors that this particular kernel is going to execute on. So remember, we are doing single instruction, multiple thread. So each thread is running this vec add function. And what you want to do is divide the work among all the threads. And we've done that in a two level hierarchy of blocks and threads within blocks. So to get the particular index for this thread, it's just one dimensional. So we're only using the X component of these variables, taking which block we're in, multiplying that by the size of the block index or the block dimension rather, and then adding our thread index as an offset into that chunk of data defined by the blocks. Host memory allocated in the normal fashion with malloc. The device memory is allocated with CUDA malloc. And then we can copy from um, the host memory to the device memory to get the inputs onto the GPU. Then we can launch our kernel, this vec add, and you see the triple chevron syntax there that allows us to specify the dimensions of the blocks and the, um, the dimensions of the grid. So the number of blocks in the grid and their organization of, sorry, the organization of the blocks in the grid, in this case, it's one dimensional, uh, and the number of threads per block. Then finally, we have to get the data off of the GPU and onto the host. 
so we can ex do something with it or examine it. And that's pretty much um, the standard flow for doing GPU computation. In that way, we can look at. Okay, so here is. Let me make this font a little bigger for you. So um, in CMake, they added CUDA language support uh, quite some time ago. So we don't need to do anything special to tell it um, how to process CUDA source files. We just have to name them with .cu and when we do add executable and the source files listed in there, CMake will figure out that it needs to run MVCC on those files. So this is just straight copy and pasted from the toolkit sample vector add. So we've got, this is just a little helper file file from the toolkit. This is the, um, sorry, this is a helper file from the toolkit samples. This CUDA runtime is the header file that you would use in your application. Here's our kernel that we saw. My IntelliSense doesn't work so great with CUDA, so that's why there are some things in red. There's actually nothing wrong with this code. So we are allocating code, allocating memory on the host for the inputs and the outputs, initializing the inputs with a bunch of random numbers, allocating space on the device for the input vectors and the output vector, getting the data from the host to the device, for the two input vectors, and then launching the kernel, and then copying the data from the device to the host, and then doing a little sanity check on it. So if we run this program, it copied the data over, it launched the kernel, it copied the data back, the answer back, and it checked the values and they all look like they computed correctly. So um, using it from CMake, pretty simple. There is one, I will show you the uh, top level CMake here. Uh, <clears throat> it's not required, but you can specify for a project what languages you are gonna use in that project. And, uh, excuse me. It's not required, but you can specify CUDA for your project as one of the languages that you're using. Um, I do uh, find package to locate the CUDA runtime library that I need to link against and the CUDA runtime headers. Uh, this stuff here, I just added as a way to conveniently use the little helper file helper file header that was used in that sample that I copied from the CUDA samples. And I set up a CMake convenience for thrust. We'll, we'll look at that a little bit later. So the whole reason we're doing this is because we're trying to get concurrency going on to, you know, hopefully improve the performance of our application, or maybe it's just the amount of data we need to process is so large that the more data we can operate on, the faster we can get done what we need to do. And in any system, uh, if you're trying to get concurrency going, it, it can be a bit of a problem because with concurrency always implies possible problems due to sharing of data and coordination of different processes happening concurrently. Um, in CPU land, this is, you know, standard threads and things like that. And um, with a CUDA application, there's an extra dimension now of this coprocessor. So we can have multiple threads on the host. That's one 
form of concurrency we can have going on. We can have code executing on the GPU, so we've got another form of concurrency going on. And these GPU cards, they don't just have uh, graphics pipelines and graphics processing units, they also have memory uh, transfer units, so direct memory access units that can transfer data quickly between the device and the host. Uh, question in the chat is um, that when we looked at this code, let's just go back to this code we were looking here. Uh, there we go. And the question is, uh, he sees some mallocs in here, and he was right. They were in here when we were allocating host memory. And he says, does CUDA support C++ style new and delete? Or maybe it doesn't matter because this would be host code. Uh, the answer is, in host code, you can use new, delete, whatever you want to use. In this particular example, the Exam this particular example in the CUDA SDK is written in more of a C style, but so that's why they're using malloc, but malloc is not necessary here. This is host memory. You can get it any way yeah, you want to. Down here, when we allocated the device memory with CUDA malloc, that is the only way to get device memory allocated. And device memory is allocated on the host in terms of, sorry, that's not the right way to say it. Device memory is allocated by the host. It is not on the host, it is on the device. But the function calls that allocate that memory and carve it up are done on the host. So memory allocation is essentially a GPU configuration step, not a GPU execution step. Um, I believe that they've got some constrained scenarios where threads running on the GPU could call CUDA malloc, but I, I'm, don't quote me on that. That could be just a mistake on my part. It's very unusual to do that though, right? Because normally what you're allocating on the GPU is scratch pad work areas, input buffers, and output buffers. And for scratch pad buffers, obviously registers are the best. Thread local storage is the next best, and then shared memory is the next best, and then global memory is what you would be allocating when you run the function calls on the host. So the slowest one is what you get from this CUDA malloc. Um, but basically all the memory allocation is happening by a result of function calls on the host and however you get your host memory is is uh, it's up to you it could be a shared memory segment could be a memory map file could be anything CUDA doesn't care because it's only used as the source or or target of copy operations um, there is advanced usages where you can have a shared address space between the CPU and the host but I'm sorry between the CPU and the GPU but we're not going to go into that depth because this is Introduction. So, um, as I was saying, you've got the execution that is obviously happening concurrently, but you can also have these copy operations in flight um, between CPU, or I guess host memory and device memory, or device memory and host memory, or device to device. You can have copy operations in flight in parallel with the execution of kernels in the blocks. So we mentioned that it's code on the host that is running as doing these memory allocations. It is doing the kernel launches and it's doing these memory copy operations. If you want to get the maximum amount of concurrency, what you really need to do is arrange everything as a bunch of asynchronous operations that are happening in a well-defined order, but we don't care about when they complete in terms of um, the intermediate steps. We just are waiting for the final result to come back to us. However, those intermediate steps may have constraints 
relative to each other such that they have to happen in a certain order, even though they've been scheduled concurrently. So in order to manage that, the uh, CUDA API provides something called a stream, and it is basically just a command FIFO, a you know, command Q. And uh, the commands within the stream are executed in the order that they were submitted to the stream. And that means that if uh, one of the commands needs something to happen before it can start, it waits until that condition has been satisfied before that command starts. Um, this is how you can combine kernel launches with um, memory copies so that the copies and the kernels could potentially overlap if they're on different streams. And as long as the um, kernel doesn't need a copy to complete, they can proceed independent of each other. Um, so this question in the chat said, is there a way to map CUDA results to pixels? And you can do that directly with interop functions in the, uh, that allow CUDA to interoperate with OpenGL or Direct3D, that you could have the output of your computation be a pixel surface or, you know, a two dimensional grid of pixels, an image, a texture, what have you in the graphics API. So you could just storing into your output buffer results in modifying this resource that's used in the graphics pipeline. Um, it's really easy to do that. It basically looks from your device code. It looks like you have a pointer to the pixel memory and you are just writing directly into it. Um, another question is, is that a typical stack CUDA OpenGL? Uh, let's take a look at this link here. Oh, it's, the link's been sanitized and it's not working for me because WebEx has got the windows all covered up. No, just basically CUDA sample, um, EGL interrupt. Uh, if it's just the sample from the SDK, then yeah, yeah. it's exactly what you do. Um, okay, so streams are how you can manage the concurrency uh, between different kernels. So within a kernel, you're managing the current concurrency by dividing up the problem into a grid of blocks, processing those blocks, and combining the block results. However, um, it's not always the case that everything you need to do is coming from just one kernel, right? You may have to launch a bunch of different kernels that do different things depending on the results or depending on your scenario. So you can orchestrate multiple kernels relative to each other, either in a single stream or using multiple streams. And um, typically you're going to have additional memory copy events going on to coordinate those events or, or coordinate those kernels as well. Now for different streams to coordinate with each other, you can use events. So you have, you basically can record an event onto a stream and then have another stream wait until that event was recorded. And that allows you to orchestrate the relative ordering of different streams that are operating concurrently in order to solve your whole problem. The thrust library is a C++ template library that is similar to the standard library in terms of the uh, algorithms and containers portions, algorithms, iterators, and containers portion of the standard library. And <clears throat> gives you vector-like containers for um, data on the host or data on the device. And the iterators from these containers understand which kind of memory they're attached to. And they give you algorithms um, that can operate in host code or they can operate in device code and it, it works fine either way. 
Now, generally with an algorithm, in order to do something interesting, most of the time, the interesting part comes from your own computation that you want to do over a sequence or on values within a sequence. And you do that, you know, with the standard library algorithms by supplying a function object, um, also called a functor. And basically this is summed up in modern C++ by just using a lambda because that's, as we saw in our presentation on lambdas, that lambdas basically are just syntactic sugar for compiler-generated function objects for you. So they provide some simple functors in this thrust functional header, like, you know, the plus operator producing a, a functor that, you know, takes two values, adds them together, returns the sum. But you can also just write a uh, device decorated lambda to do whatever kind of work you need to do within the application of an algorithm. So thrust gives uh, algorithms for searching, for copying, reductions, merging, reordering, prefix sums, which is a, a kind of um, kind of a, a, a an advanced version of accumulate. If you're familiar with the algorithm of standard accumulate in the C++ standard library, there's a set operations, sorting, and transformations. Now, um, we'll take a look at this uh, in, in a second here, but the, C, the CUDA C++ standard library effort, I think is uh, either overlapping here in, in some senses, um, in that they're providing I believe standard library algorithm implementations that are run on the GPU, so they can just be used from GPU code. Um, the thrust code is more oriented towards um, something that looks like you're running an algorithm from the standard library, and it turns into launching a kernel on the device with uh, the inputs um, copied over to the GPU and the kernel runs the algorithm on the device and then the output is written back to uh, either the GPU or it's written back to the host or, or what have you. Uh, so here is that same add vector sample that I took when we looked at it before it was using the runtime API directly and I just copy and pasted that I didn't make any modifications to it at all here what I've done is I've converted it to use thrust to do the exact same thing so here we have the thrust host vector class so this represents a dynamically resizable array of T in host memory so I am creating my two host input vectors here and I'm initializing them using the generate algorithm from this, the standard library. So I'm just taking that lambda and I am running it over every element in those two sequences and generating new values to be stored in those sequences. Next, I'm going to allocate some device memory with the device vector class and I'm using the copy constructor. So what thrust does is it says, oh, you're allocating a chunk of memory on the device and you're initializing it with a chunk of memory that's on the host. So what I will do is call CUDA malloc to get the appropriate amount of device memory for the size that this vector needs to be to accept that input. And then I will call uh, CUDA mem copy to copy the host data to the newly allocated device array. So I do that for the two device input vectors. And then for the uh, device output vector, I just need to have it appropriately sized. So in that case, it will do the CUDA malloc to get the device memory allocated, but it doesn't do a copy because it, it, it's just a, a, uh, default constructed T in the allocated memory, right? When you 
when you use this form of the constructor of std vector that takes a size, it's not specifying the capacity, it's specifying the size of the vector. So it's not that it can hold num elements, it's that it does hold num elements. And then we're going to invoke the kernel. It's the same as before, except now because our device memory is represented by these device vector classes, we need to get the raw pointer out of there. So we can use raw pointer cast to um, get the address of the zeroth element of those three vectors. And then finally, we need to get the data back onto the host. I think my, okay, that was device memory, A, B, and C on the device. And then, uh, oops, sorry. Now that we need to get the device data copied over onto the host, we can create a host vector initialized by a device vector, and it will allocate the memory on the host copy the data from the device to the host. And we can take a look at what that looks like. So here, um, same add executable as we did before. And this time I've just said that I depend on the, the CUDA runtime right? Everything's going to depend on the CUDA runtime. Um, actually, I could take this out. I just didn't take it out, but I'm going to use uh, thrust. And all that's really doing is just setting up include search path location because thrust is a header only library. It's just a convenience in CMake to have an imported target that knows where those include directories live. So I don't have to specify that path explicitly. And if I need to, I can configure it using CMake's configuration interface. So source file, um, I've stripped out all that helper stuff. We don't need that anymore. Here's stuff from the standard library that I'm using, C++ standard library. Here's the device vector and host vector that I'm using from Thrust. It's still a CUDA file, so this global annotation still applies. That's our kernel. That hasn't changed. Here's our allocating the host vectors, filling them out, allocating the device vectors, and the device vector for the output, launching the kernel, getting the data from the device back over to the host, and running our little check on it. So if we run this program, Studio always wants to be in front. Uh, we can see that it ran the same as before. It copied the results back from the device and everything agrees with its computation that it performed on the host. So um, I think, you know, if I have to <clears throat> manage this device memory myself, I have to know when I have to reallocate it to make it larger because now my input problem size changed, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'd rather have that inside some kind of vector class than have to deal with that myself. Now, <clears throat> we did raw pointer cast down here when we called the kernels or the kernel. Um, that's because the kernel just needs to access this data it doesn't need to allocate it or resize it. It's a, that's all been decided by the time we get here. So just dealing with a raw pointer here, these raw pointers in no way indicate ownership. Uh, the ownership decisions are made by the host code that has already run before this kernel is launched. So that part pretty much stays the same. The getting the data back and forth is easier. Now, some people don't like the, they don't like the uh, fact that, you know, the, the so-called work is hidden in the constructors and so on. I, I think that's the whole point of an abstraction is to hide work. It doesn't mean you should use these things 
in a naive manner and result in excessive data excessive data copying either to or from the GPU because you know it's just not going to be the way to make things run as fast as possible. Uh, this question in here says, is there support for move semantics between CPU and GPU? And I believe the answer is not in Thrust. I have not looked at the proposed CUDA C++ standard library. I think from the way that I've seen it uh, pitched, which is like a one sentence summary of a presentation, um, that I believe that that CUDA C++ standard library is meant to be a standard library implementation for device code entirely. Anything that's mixing address spaces is going to be happening on the host. Um, another question is, if there are two distinct locations, one in CPU DRAM and the other in GPU DRAM, I, I don't think move semantics can, can optimize it. So that was a comment. I, yeah, I mean, moving... The only, the only thing moving would get you is if you implemented move semantics from the CPU to the GPU, say. It would mean um, you moved it from host memory to GPU memory. That would just turn into a CUDA mem copy. And then the resulting source vector, which was in host memory space, would just now be empty. So you would lose the host copy and gain a device copy. I, I, I don't know that there's a whole lot of I think it advantages just, of doing that. Just advantage would be like reduction in uh, CPU DRAM usage. Uh, but yeah. Well, okay. The dirty secret of memory allocation in a host process is memory is never returned to the operating system. So you didn't gain anything that you didn't you didn't gain anything that you couldn't gain yourself by just saying, you know, host vector dot clear. Oh, yeah, interesting. If you go look at memory allocators, for instance, on on Linux or old school, you know, it's S break on old school Unix, is the thing that you call to obtain virtual memory from the operating system in a process. Every memory allocator. When it runs out of memory, it will ask more from the operating system. But if the operating system gives it to it, it will never give it back to the operating system. It, it is possible to do that, but I've never seen a memory allocator that does do that. So it just becomes part of the virtual address space of your host process. And whether you call free or clear doesn't, it, it, it frees up pressure on the allocator, but it doesn't free up memory all the way if you know what i mean yeah, yeah, yeah but you can just do that yourself by saying you know you um copy the host vector into the destination vector and then you say host vector dot clear yeah i guess dot clear isn't quite the same as moving it because in std vector clear does not necessarily um, release the allocation of the of that represents the capacity of the container, but I believe if you do clear and then shrink to fit, it does guarantee that the memory is released back to at least your memory allocator. Yeah, I mean it gives it back to the allocator, so the next time you call new, that memory is available for that call to new, but it 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 doesn't go away from the process back to the operating system. It never goes that far. It, you could have it go that far. I've just never heard of or seen an allocator that actually does that. That's interesting, yeah. Uh, okay, I think we're caught up on questions. One, uh, let's see. Um, one question is, uh, why would, uh, I mean, if I'm to use all C++ all the way, uh, do you think, is there any disadvantage in using uh, thrust device vector of car star for doing all the allocations or uh, compared to using malloc, uh, CUDA malloc explicitly? Well, it, uh, thrust library is a header-only library, so you can 
you know, step through it in the debugger and see exactly what it's oh, doing. Okay. It's basically, it's calling coup to malloc to get yeah. a, a capacity <laughs> having, that it needs. good syntactic sugar. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's, well, that's what std vector is too, right? Std oh, yeah. vector is entirely implemented in a header as an inline template class. And you can examine the entire implementation and you will find out that all it's doing is new and delete and mem copy. Mem copy when it is suitable. That's an optimization. Yeah. Conceptually, it does a mem copy. Semantically, it, it has to do element by element copy in order to guarantee that non-trivial constructors and destructors are run, etc. Yes. Which, by the way, Thrust also guarantees. Oh, nice. Right. I mean, I, I have a devo device vector of float in this example. I can just as easily have a device vector of a user-defined data type where the constructor does something non-trivial. What will Thrust do? Thrust will call CUDA malloc to obtain the raw memory. Then it will launch a kernel that invokes my user-defined constructor in place on each of the elements necessary to default construct my user-defined type. That's awesome. Yeah. So <laughs> it is obtaining the semantics of a std vector, even though the memory that you're manipulating is on the GPU, and in order to run the constructor for your data type, on the GPU, it has to launch a kernel that does the things that std vector does, which is when you um, when you resize a std vector, you didn't give it the value that should be constructed. It default constructs whatever the type is that is on the vector. So thrust will do that for you because that's what the semantics of the vector are. Now that may be something you don't want to have happen, in which case you just, you just use CUDA malloc. Yeah, okay. Right? If you don't, you don't care if the memory is initialized, you can just use CUDA malloc because that's what it's going to give you is uninitialized memory. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thanks. Um, okay, so using CUDA from CMake in a modern CMake, works really great. I, I, you know, all I had to do was uh, make sure that um, I had installed the CUDA toolkit after I had installed whatever compiler I wanted to use because on Windows, and I believe this is Windows only, on Windows, uh, the CUDA toolkit sprinkles in a little CUDA integration into the compiler, into Visual Studio, so that when you run CMake, it can automatically locate the MVCC CUDA compiler and it can locate um, all the binary tools that it needs to run as part of the build process. Because remember, CUDA language support in CMake, as long as you have 3.8 or later, which 3.8 is really quite old at this point, um, it's built in there. So when you configure with CMake, we can, in fact, we can take a look at it. I don't think I have my configure output handy, but in my top level CMake, all, I mean, I, I did this, but even saying that I was using CUDA was, you know, not necessarily required. And this fine package that I did, that was just so I could get um, the CUDA runtime that I link against. But if I was not necessarily needing to do that, then I, I guess it's not true. You always need to link against the CUDA runtime if you're using any of the CUDA runtime functions. So that just gave me a nice uh, imported target for the CUDA runtime. I think but I don't need it to compile a CUDA file. I don't need to find the toolkit in order to compile a CUDA file. The CMake's CUDA language support uh, took care of that as long as, like I installed Visual Studio 2019, after I had installed the CUDA toolkit. So at first it didn't work. It said it couldn't find NVCC, but I reinstalled the CUDA toolkit and then it was fixed. So it, it was really easy. 
linking to CUDA RT shouldn't, uh, sorry, CUDA runtime shouldn't be needed because it will be compiled with NVCC under the hood, right? Uh, that, that used to be the case when it couldn't recognize CUDA as official. Well, we can find out. Yeah. All I got to do is go over here. I mean, I work on Linux. That might be the only difference. Yay, my Visual Studio keyboard shortcut is bound to something in WebEx. All right, let's just do it this way. <laughs> uh, so it did correctly link. You can't see it until I do this. But it, it rebuilt. Oops, I get, I'm so used to keyboard shortcuts and WebEx isn't liking it. <laughs> so it, it, it rebuilt the, this sample without linking against the CUDA RT. So I think you're right that uh, the, com the MVCC compiler is doing that for you. But suppose I was writing some kind of code that didn't launch any kernels but still interacted with CUDA and then it wouldn't be compiled with MVCC because oh, it would yeah, just be yeah. CPP yeah. files. Yeah. Then I would need to link against uh, the CUDA runtime. Yeah. Um, so the, the CUDA language support makes it really easy to use from CMake. And if you want to get access to um, the headers, you know, in things like thrusts and stuff like that, you can do find CUDA toolkit to get the location of your toolkit and then do any additional find file stuff necessary to locate particular things, create imported targets as a matter of convenience. Um, there is a, this policy, uh, CMP 0104, which you might get a um, warning about when you configure and it has to do with when we discussed before that your CUDA code when compiled to the device, it can either can be compiled to a version of PTX, a versionless PTX, or it can be compiled towards a specific GPU architecture in the form of Kubins. They changed the policy saying um, how the set of default architectures that are targeted by the compiler into a Kubin form are specified. And it'll complain to you that you haven't set this variable if you haven't adjusted the policy setting. Uh, so in the chat, there's another question here. It says, is it possible to run CUDA in a Hyper-V VM? So, um, and another uh, comment from here says, you know, it can work in WSL, which is Windows subsystem. Uh, it's, it's the Windows Linux subsystem, right? It's the Windows subsystem for Linux. That's what it is, WSL. This is basically running real Linux inside Windows with a minimal amount of um, VM trampolining in between. Now, they've made some effort in making CUDA visible from WSL. And uh, <clears throat> that's what Mihir is commenting on. And the question is, can you run it in other VMs, like in you know, VMware, whatnot? And I believe it's always been possible, but the GPU itself is not virtualized that it is what's called PCI pass-through, where a PCI device on the host is made visible as a PCI device in the guest. And that means you can access the GPU uh, from the VM, provided you've enabled this uh, you know, PCI bridge functionality. But what it means is um, because the access is not virtualized, means the virtual machines can interfere with each other because they're all sharing the same physical GPU. The GPU is not virtualized. And it, they can also interfere with the host because, again, the access is not virtualized. Um, so the, that policy will be annoying. It, it, just, just so you know, it, it's harmless, but like most of those policy warnings are. But if you don't like seeing that output, you can set it appropriately. Um, the CUDA toolkit documentation from which I have lifted 
examples and figures is really pretty well written. There's a programming guide, which is where I recommend you start. And from the programming guide, you will learn about various uh, scenarios and how to uh, achieve them with CUDA. And then from there, you can drill into the reference for all the particular functions in order to, in their arguments. Um, Thrust is also documented in the toolkit, but they have um, Doxygen generated uh, documentation up on GitHub so that um, the, the Thrust documentation that's in the toolkit gives a general overview of Thrust, kind of like I've done. And if you want to drill deeper, then it's, it's, you know, it's off to the Doxygen for you, which you can find on GitHub. Thrust is maintained on GitHub, and uh, the version on GitHub may be newer than what's in whatever the current CUDA SDK is. Although the CUDA SDK releases at a pretty good cadence, so you won't, you're not, as long as you're staying up to date on the CUDA SDK releases, you're not likely to lag very far behind. Uh, there's also a, uh, a huge chunk of, as you might imagine, of NVIDIA's website dedicated to developers, and that's the NVIDIA Developer Zone. Um, I believe you have to register to join. Um, so uh, depending on how you feel about giving your email address out, you know, just make a, a, a Gmail account or whatever like that if, if that's how you prefer to do things. Um, I don't, I mean, I've been registered on there um, and I, I don't recall, you know, getting a lot of, you know, spammy type messages, but I usually, the first thing I do after I register is go and turn off all email notifications myself, but, you know, whatever works for you guys. Um, there's also an annual um, technology conference and I believe all the past presentations are online. Um, you can register for the, it's been virtual the past two years, I believe. And uh, it's likely to be virtual again because things are crazy. Uh, registration is free, so you, you know you don't have to be somebody spending millions of dollars on NVIDIA cards for your data center to be somebody that can get the information at that conference. Also, as we saw CUDA having been introduced in 2006, so that's 14, 15 years ago, uh, there's obviously a huge online community around CUDA. So asking questions on Stack Overflow or in the video developer forums or wherever you go to get your programmer answers, um, there's likely to be lots of other people who have done this before you and can help you out. Um, are there any further questions before we wrap things up? Either by audio or by chat. If you want to do audio, make sure you unmute yourself first. Okay. Uh, seems there are no questions, so we will end it there.